going to talk a lot about personal finances as well as your finances for your business. Next week we're going to take a deeper dive into your credit where one of my colleagues um, from our, our lending department is going to be here and they're going to go into depth on credit um, and everything like that. And I see from everybody that has a packet um, and a name tag, you've gone through the process of submitted financial information. So one of the beautiful things about it, and I want to give a shout out to our partner in this, uh, which is PPAC Gladstone Bank, is that at the end of this, you get a $500 loan. Loans are great, but loans need to be repaid, right? Thanks to PPAC Gladstone, they repay the loan on your behalf. So you basically walk out of here with a $500 check uh, to use as you see fit, and uh, PPAC will make the payments on your behalf. So if anything else, it helps your credit because it's actually a positive repayment history um, that's being paid by a third party. So it's a nice little benefit to this program. Um, let me tell you briefly about uh, who we are. UCEDC is a nonprofit economic development organization. We cover the entire state of New Jersey as well as some parts of Pennsylvania and New York. Uh, our mission is really to help small businesses get started, grow, thrive. We do that through training classes. We do that through lending programs. And we have some other services like government procurement and um, resource, business resources and things of that nature. Um, but we work with businesses of all shapes and sizes all throughout the state of New Jersey. And we've been doing this a long time. We've been here since 1977. Not me personally, but uh, you know, the organization in and of itself started off as the Union County Economic Development Corporation uh, back in 1977. Over time, we grew our programs, expanded our territories, so now we are United Counties Economic Development, but we usually just go by our acronym. Um, so that is a, a, a nice uh, benefit, and if you are interested in any of our other programs or finding out about more things that we do, you have my card in there. Uh, best bet is to go to our website and you can actually see all of our different programs and what other training classes might be upcoming. Um, they might not be geared directly towards childcare, but there's a lot of general business classes. They're, they're uh, usually free that you're welcome to attend and, and there's online registration. So we try to make the process easy and painless as, as possible. And a lot of them, because we deal with small business owners, and I know when I was a small business owner, I couldn't leave my office at 10 o'clock or whatever to go to a training class. So a lot of them are done on off hours, night times, and things of that nature to benefit the small business owners. Um, okay, a couple more things about today. As we said, this is session one of two. This session is longer. On paper, we're scheduled to go until three. Um, but I've been doing this a while. We can cut. We can. Uh, Mediate that a little bit and we can actually probably get out of here I don't want to put any guarantees on it but earlier than that okay um, we will bring lunch in at about 12 meta is that roughly um, one of the options I always like to throw out to people is we can take a full lunch break or we can kind of grab something quickly come back continue and that way that will help speed us and get us out earlier that's your decision but uh, I'll I'll uh, I'll let you guys decide on that. Do you want to you want to take lunch. that approach? Working lunch. Working, Working lunch. lunch. Everybody good with that? Yes. yes. Love you people. I love this class. <laughs> okay, that's what I was hoping you would say. Um, yes, I've never ever had one class say, "Oh no, let's take a long lunch and stay till three. So, um, <laughs> so you're right on on point with any of that. Feel free. You know, there's donuts, there's coffee, there's um, uh, water and, and juice back there. Um, it's a Saturday, it's summertime, it's hot, so keep yourself, you know, uh, hydrated and keep yourself uh, refreshed with some food as we go, because uh, we're going to be covering a, a lot of different uh, things today. Okay, any questions before we get started? Okay, as I mentioned, my name's Eric Peter, I'm the Director of Training here at UCEDC. I have been at UCEDC for almost, just under 10 years now, and um, I've, uh, I've been working and really have developed a lot of these training programs throughout the state. So, you know, we have a wide variety of knowledge. As I mentioned, we work with a lot of different businesses, but one thing we saw was that there was a lack of true business training for home-based childcare providers. And we have a soft spot for childcare. 
We do a lot of work with child care, both center-based, home-based. And one of the things that we noticed was that a lot of the child care centers, the home-based child care centers, don't really view themselves as businesses. Okay? They kind of would uh, view themselves as a glorified babysitting service. Okay? You're not. You're a business owner. Okay? And you need to treat yourself like business owners and think in that manner. So we put this program together to really focus on the fact that, you know, you are businesses and we're going to teach you some things that you may know, you may not know about acting like a business and controlling your finances and really taking control to make yourself the most profitable you can be and put yourself in the best position. Um, and that's really what we wanted to focus on with this course. I was a business owner myself before I came here and uh, for about six years uh, I'm an accountant by education uh, and then I owned a, a business like I mentioned for about six years and uh, then came here so I have you know the financial background as well as a small business ownership which I think is a nice mix because I thought I knew everything when I started my business and uh, I learned very quickly that I didn't so you know, a lot of the things that you're going to learn are from trial and error, but we want to help you at least mitigate some of those mistakes and try to put you in a, in a position where you can be the most successful. Because we know, as home-based child care providers, and Cheryl was, was saying it before, one of the biggest frustrations you might have is you can only have a certain amount of kids. Okay, and with that, that means you can only have a certain amount of income. So you have to try to maximize that income and make yourself, you know, the most... Um, the most efficient uh, in running those businesses and we want to talk uh, about some of the basics of financial management that's what we're going to cover today okay we're a small group you look like a friendly group okay, I haven't gotten any uh, any bad vibes yet so feel free to ask questions because if you have a question and you're hesitant to ask it I guarantee you somebody else probably has the same question so don't be afraid to uh, shoot right out if you do have any questions that didn't get answered or you were hesitant to ask, um, like I said, shoot me an email, give me a call after the fact, and I'll be happy to uh, you know, talk you through and, and um, answer any questions you might have. Okay? But don't be shy today. So what are we going to cover today? Today we're going to review the accounting process. I know that's probably the most exciting thing you want to do on a Saturday morning. Everybody wakes up and say, boy, I can't wait to talk about accounting. We're going to understand the basic uh, types of financial statements that you could use as a business uh, owner to help your business. And we're going to talk about what they mean and what they show us as business owners. And then we're going to get into some of the more personal stuff, which is financial information and taxes. All the slides we go through today are in your packet. Meta was nice enough to uh, print them up. Feel free to take as many notes as you want on those, uh, as well as there are some handouts in the back too that um, you know we're going to be using throughout the throughout the class today. Um, so those packets are yours to have and to hold and to do with as you please. Okay, the first thing we want to talk about is accounting and bookkeeping for your business. Okay. Most small business owners put a very low priority on keeping their books. Okay? You don't open a business to because you're really interested in doing bookkeeping. It just doesn't work. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm an accountant. When I own my business, the accounting part was the last thing I did. And that was even my background because it wasn't fun. I didn't start a business to keep my books. I started to produce my products and services and to serve my customers. And um, accounting was kind of what was the necessary evil of, of the business. Um, but it's also very important to have a good handle on your finances. Uh, because if you do have a good set of books and records, you know, it can help you really easily monitor how well you're doing as a business owner. Um, if you don't have a good set of books and records, how do you know if you're profitable? How do you know if you're spending too much on one area or if you're charging people enough? Good morning. Good morning. Sorry. How are you? That's okay. Um, so, see what I tell you, as soon as I start talking, it brings me going. Um, so it's important to keep a good set of books and records when you have a business. Real quickly, uh, and I know I've spoken to some of you, how many people have been operating their business for under five years? Okay, I'm sorry, what's your name? Yeah, 
There you go. If you have these name tags, face them up so I can personalize it. Don't face them like this unless you uh, forget what your own name is. Um, then you can refer to that, but if this way, then I can look. Um, so how about under 10 years? How many people are under 10 years? Boy, we got some veterans in this class here. Okay. Other people around under like 20 years you've been doing this business? Or 20 plus? Who's 20 plus? Everybody should be 20 plus. You haven't, uh, Lucretia, how long have you had your I've been doing it for 19 years, but I've been licensed for two. Okay, okay, good. All right. Hi, ladies, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Okay. Um, so, it's important to really keep a good set of books and records because you need to understand if your progress is doing. Now, you folks have been doing this for a long time. How do you keep your books and records? Do you use a system like QuickBooks? Do you use, do you use one? Quicken? Okay. Does anybody else use a system or is it just kind of manual to record your receipts and things like that? Okay. And that's fine. You know, the, the thing I, I always found as, as a, an accountant is that I don't recommend a particular system to a person because I always try to tell them you have to use a system that, that fits you, that you're going to actually do. If you give somebody a big complicated system and saying this is the system for you and they're not comfortable with it, what are they going to do? Not do it, right? Not use it correctly. So find a system that works for you and that way you can, you know, you can um, keep up with your books and records. It can also, having a good set of books and records can make it easier to file your taxes. When I worked in the public accounting world, I always thought it was a myth when people would say, oh, they come in with the shoebox full of receipts. People really do that. And bigger companies than I expected would come in with a big pile of receipts and say, can you do my taxes for me? And you know what an accountant says when somebody comes in with a big stack of papers and asks them to do your accounting? What do they say? What would you say if you were an accountant and somebody brought it in a big mess? I said, not today. <laughs> no, no, no. I said, definitely today, because I'm going to charge you for yeah, every minute you. I spend on doing on putting that together. Yeah. So it's a, exactly the opposite. So by having a nice, clean set of books and records, it can make your filing your taxes easier and, and cheaper for you. And it can also help you identify the things that you can take advantage of in terms of deductions and things of that nature. So, so that will help too. Um, if you ever are in a situation when you need to borrow money by having a good set of books and records, it can tell you when you need to borrow money as well as how much. Okay? As a lending institution, we get calls from businesses all the time and it usually starts off like this. I'd like to get a loan for my business. So we say, sure, how much do you think you're looking for? And they say, I don't know, how much can I get? So what do you think we say? Not today. <laughs> okay? Because if you don't know how much you're looking for, you certainly don't have a plan to as to how you're going to be able to repay. So it can help you in that regard as to determine when you might need money and when um, you know when you're uh, in a good position to actually buy other things and, and you know maybe uh, increase the value of your business in that way. So. Um, Keeping a good set of books and records is key. So let's go back and let's uh, start with the different types of accounts you might have. And the way these accounts work is they basically fall into five categories. Assets, liabilities, equity, revenue, and expenses. These transactions that we have for our business get broken out into these, what I like to call buckets. One analogy I like to use for people is think about doing the laundry. You get a big stack of dirty clothes, and I do my laundry for my kids. That's my job in our house. Um, and then, you know, everything's together, and then you start to separate them out. Whites go here, you know, sheets and towels go here, dark colors go here. So you, the same thing with your accounting. You're taking a big bunch of transactions, and you're breaking them out and putting them into the appropriate buckets so you can record them properly for your business. So let's talk about some of these categories in more detail. An asset. Assets are resource controlled by the enterprise from which future economic benefits, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Big accounting definition. What it really means is assets are the stuff that you own. Okay? They're the things that you own that has a value to the business. Um, 
Assets basically get broken down into two different categories, current assets and long-term assets. And current are things that are either cash or can be converted into cash within 12 months from today. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, if you have something like, let's say you sell DVDs okay, to your, the parents or whatever, maybe you get you know, a deal on some DVDs that are educational or something of that nature. I know when my kids were in daycare, we had this one guy who would sing and write songs and the center sold his DVDs there. Okay, so that's what is really inventory. And that essentially you can turn into cash because you expect to sell those things and get cash from them uh, within 12 months. A longer term asset is something that is really expected to have a value or can be turned into a benefit for more than 12 months from today. What does that mean? Something like, let's say you buy a vehicle if you're offering you know, services, uh, transportation services to pick up children, drop off, or whatever like that. That vehicle, we hope, is going to have a, a, a benefit to the company for longer than 12 months, so we would consider that to be a long-term asset. Also something if you ever graduate or if you choose to graduate from you know, a home base to a center base, then you might want to buy your building or something like that, that would be a long-term asset. Things like desks and chairs and maybe playground equipment, all that type of stuff is assets because it has a benefit that's going to continue to give value to the business. Okay? So what are some examples of uh, assets? Remember, this is stuff that we own, okay? Uh, again, just to reiterate, if anybody has questions, you know, um, in, uh, Ed is, is bilingual and he can help with any of the concepts and um, he'll be happy to sit with you and explain it or translate it or whatever you do. Um, so we have certain, so some current assets, remember, things that are quickly, could be cash, could be some securities, accounts receivable. I'm not sure how you folks bill your customers, but if you bill them out and they pay you after the fact, that's considered an account receivable. Then you provided the services, you have a legal right to obtain that money from the customer, they just haven't paid you yet. So that's an asset to the company because you know that's something that's gonna be turned into cash. Inventory we talked about, uh, something like a prepaid expense. If you uh, have an insurance policy that you, know, you pay it January 1st and it covers the whole year, well, you've already paid it, but you're getting value from that over the next 12 months or whatever. That would be considered a prepaid expense. And some longer term things are notes receivable, real estate like we talked about, as well as some fixed assets, which we also talked about. Desks, chairs, um, sometimes computer equipment or something like that, uh, playground equipment, vehicles, things of that that um, has a longer term value to the company. Those are some examples of of assets. Okay? A lot of people say, well, what about you know my employees? Are they assets? No, they're not assets. You don't own them. Okay, um, They can leave at any time, so while they might bring a value to the company, it's not something you own. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Just briefly, a fixed asset. So if you have a fixed asset, and let's just use an example, instead of machinery, we'll call that a vehicle, okay? You always want to list it at the value that you purchased it at. So if I went out and I purchased, I know it's a bad example because you can't do that, uh, if you bought a car for $10,000, maybe you can, you buy a used van or something like that, um, I'm going to list that at $10,000, but over a period of time, that's going to depreciate, right? It's not going to have the same value. So then we actually start to expense that, which we'll talk about later on, over the life of that asset so by the time let's say it has five years by the time that five years is up it would have essentially a zero value on your books you may still be using it but you just re recognize the benefit uh, of it over the time that that uh, we think the, the life would be for that for that asset does anybody um, have things like that any type of longer term assets like uh, playground equipment or vehicles or anything like that for their centers or yes okay. you have playground stuff yeah okay. good so um, yeah and that you can get some good life out of that and it gives it a continuing value because then 
the reason you want to add the assets like that to the business is because then when I'm a prospective customer and I'm looking to you know have somebody watch my children I could go and I could say well Aparna is that how I say it? Yes. Aparna. I could go to Aparna and she's got nothing just a big empty lot and I can go to Kelly and Kelly has some nice playground equipment well I might want to send my kid to her instead of to you. No offense I'm sure you have a wonderful uh, situation. Um, so those those assets can bring value to you in getting customers and, and building the value of the business. <clears throat> the second bucket we want to talk about is what's called liabilities. Now again, it's got a, an accounting <coughs> definition of there, but if assets are the things we own, liabilities are the things that we owe. Okay, they're the bad side of the equation. Okay, uh, not really though because you use it. Now. So a liability is. Um, is things that our business owes to people and have to get paid out. Like assets, we break them out into also current and long term. And in this case, a current liability would some would be something we have to pay within 12 months of today. Okay? And a longer term is something that might we might have to repay out after 12 months. So you might ask, what what possibly could I have that I would have to pay out longer than 12 months? could be a loan, it could be a mortgage, it could be something of that nature. So there are some things that are longer term um, that you have to pay out. And we'll look at some examples. Accounts payable, so if you buy some, whether it's supplies or you know, um, inventory we talked about or things like that, and you're billed on account, you have to pay that bill, that's a liability. You've already received the goods or services, now you have to pay them out, you have an obligation. Credit cards, if you uh, buy stuff on your credit card and have to pay that back, uh, then that would be considered a liability. Any taxes, any salaries, or anything of that nature. Do any of you folks have people that help you out that work for you, employees per se? <coughs> or do you all just do it all yourself? Husband your husband helps? Well, you don't pay him anyway, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay, so that's good. So just so I can tailor the conversation a little bit. Um, but if you did have, um, you know, a person that might help you out for a couple hours or something come in, so you could do some other aspects of the business, then you would have, um, you know, pay them a salary and you might have an obligation for the, the time that they worked. Um, longer term, as we mentioned, loans, mortgages, things like that, things of that nature. Okay? So far, are we good? Yes. yes. Okay. Every class is different, so if I'm going too fast, too slow, just let me know. Los que hablan español, si tienen alguna pregunta, yo se la puedo contestar. Okay. The third bucket we're talking about here then is owner's equity. So, owner's equity is the amount of money you've invested or retained in the business. Here's a simple way to look at it. Okay. If you took all your assets and turned them into cash. You paid off all your liabilities, what's left is your owner's equity. Or a very simplified way of looking at the value of the business at any point in time. Okay? Uh, so if I, if I um, and we'll, we'll look at a, uh, an example later, um, if I was able to today say, I don't want to be in this business anymore, I'm just going to take all my assets, turn them into cash, maybe sell any equipment I have or collect all my receivables, and then pay off everybody I owe, What's left in my pocket, that's my owner's equity. That's the value of my business at that point in time. Okay. Um, how many people here are, does anyone here like a, have their business as an LLC? You do, Ken, Kelly? Yeah, a couple of you. Okay, wow, and we're shooting up. Okay, so if you're an LLC, it's also considered member's equity because anyone who has an, an ownership stake in an LLC is considered a member. So you might hear member's equity or owner's equity or even shareholder's equity if you talk about corporations or anything like that. It's really all the same thing. The components that make up owner's equity are paid in capital. Okay, uh, Paid in capital is the amount of money you put into the business to maybe get it started or maybe if you've gone through a period of time where you're low on funds but you need pay some expenses, you might put, unfortunately, additional money into the business. That's called paid in capital, because okay? you're paying it in as the owner 
to the business. You're giving a value to the business. Then there's retained earnings. Retained earnings is basically the amount of money you've made over time in the business. So I'll show you an example in a minute that might make that a little clearer. An owner's draw is also a part of equity, and that's the money you take out of the business. Okay? Because most people, as a, as a sole proprietor or as an LLC, you don't pay yourself a paycheck. What you do is you just take money out as needed or hopefully on a consistent basis, and that reduces the amount, the value of the business, because you're essentially taking it out. It reduces the amount of owner's equity. Okay? If you took out $5,000, then the value of your business is less because you have then less money at the end of the day to, uh, to pay off your liabilities and things like that. Here's an example, and hopefully this makes it clear. clear. So, I'm starting my, my uh, home-based child care center in 2018. So at the beginning of the year, I had nothing because I hadn't started. Mm -hmm. But then, let's say I started in February. Mm -hmm. or, argument's sake. I put in $5,000, and that $5,000 I'm putting in is used to get the space and the proper, you know, set up properly. It's maybe to buy some uh, some playground equipment or to, you know, put in little desks or chairs or, or buy cribs or whatever it might be. Uh, so I put in $5,000 to get the business started. Over the course of the year, I'm fortunate enough that I make $20,000. So my, my revenues and exceed my expenses, which we'll talk about in a minute, by $20,000. That's my income from the year. So that gets added into my equity. However, I have to live, I have bills to pay, so I pulled out $18,000. That's essentially my salary. In this case, it's the owner's draw. And then at the end of the year, my equity is $7,000. So as you can see, it's the amount you put in plus the amount you retain less the amount you've taken out, and that's how you um, you calculate your owner's equity. Any questions? Comments? <coughs> yes? So how about the paid capital if you take it alone? Mm -hmm. so how do you count that owner's equity in that way? Well, a loan is not, uh, is not a function of that. A loan is a liability because you're taking that out from a third party, and you have to pay that third party back. So, so you the, cannot count it as a paid capital? No. Paid in capital is only what you put into the business. Paid in no. cash. And yeah, cash, or it could be equipment too. If you have, okay. let's say you have your car, let's say you have a van, and you say, well, you know what, I'm gonna use this van in the business, I'm gonna put it in the business name. Well, you're adding that value to the business, so that could be a part of paid in capital too, whatever the value of that van is. It doesn't have to be just cash. Okay? Or you can say, a lot of people do it, I'm, I have a computer, I'm gonna use this in my business, so that's an investment into the business. Okay, but paid in capital is really money coming from someone else that you're gonna to have to pay back to that person, so then that would not be, you know, a part of owner's equity, it would be a liability. Okay, it's a good question. Okay, the fourth bucket we're gonna talk about are revenues. Revenues are, are the thing we like the most, right? They're the money that we generate uh, generate through our business activities. That's what we get paid. So when you go out and you have five children in your center and each one of those parents pay you, um, that's considered revenue to the business. Okay, and that's why, that's why we do this, right? To make money. <laughs> um, so all the revenues that come in you know, are, are positives and they are used to pay off our expenses. Because unfortunately, we have costs to run a business too. We have specific costs that have to offset our revenue. And they're broken out really into two categories. Cost of goods sold or direct expenses and, um, and then selling general administrative or indirect expenses. One of the things you'll find out about accounting is they have different names for the same thing. Um, so it's a, it, sometimes people can get confused. But the distinction between these two is that I always like to look at it. The cost of goods sold is I wouldn't incur that expense if I wasn't generating some revenue. So here's an example. If I have two kids in my, in my um, center and I'm comfortable with that, but you know what? Two more kids come in and now it's too, a little too much for me to handle. So I have to hire somebody else to help me out. 
that's a direct cost of having those two additional kids because I wouldn't have to hire that person if I didn't have those those two extra children. And I know you guys are all you can handle more than two, but that was just my I can't I can't even handle my two. So, um, <laughs> um, so those are direct costs. They directly relate to generating that revenue. The, the indirect costs they're the cost of running the business that would exist if you had five kids or if you had no kids. Those are going to be things like utilities. They're going to be things like in some cases rent, not, not in your case. Um, but those are costs that are always going to be there. They're always kind of fixed regardless of the level of revenues that you have. Advertising, things of that nature. Um, the cost of doing business. So some examples, like we said, direct labor, materials. So another cost of goods sold is, let's say you are selling, I'll stick with my example of DVDs. Um, if you are going to sell these DVDs to the parents or whatever, um, you have to buy them first, so that's a direct cost that you would have to realize to generate that revenue. Um, maybe add some out of, certain out-of-pocket costs, might be gas and tolls. If you're running transportation for, for these, uh, these kids, if you're taking them on a trip or if you're taking them, picking them up from school, bringing them home from school, whatever it might be, um, or from their house is probably a better example. You wouldn't incur that if you didn't have worth making the revenue uh, on that. Okay, same thing like meals too. Okay, if you charge an extra for, for meals, um, you have to pay for those meals first, and then, uh, then you get the revenue on the back end. Okay, so we mentioned some of the indirect expenses, rent, utilities, advertising, any supplies you might have too. You know, you're always going to have a supply of diapers on hand, of wipes, and things like that. You know, extra cups or, or something of that nature. Um, so those would be things that you're going to have there, regardless of uh, whether you have the, the children there or not. <laughs> Any questions? No. Okay. Good. Going at a nice pace. Okay. So. Once we look at all those different types of accounts, so now what we've done is we've actually taken our laundry and we've separated it all out into all the different types of uh, accounts or all the different groups, and now we're going to say, well, what does all this stuff tell us? So that's where we use financial statements, okay? And if anybody's using a system, I, I think uh, Kelly was the only one who said she's using like Quicken. Does anybody else use any type of accounting system, or is it just manual? Okay, so in Quicken, you can produce financial reports for you, okay? And there's three basic ones we want to talk about for your business. Um, your balance sheet, yes? Oh, I thought you were raising your hand, okay. Um, balance sheet, your profit and loss statement, and your statement of cash flows. So you can kind of see on here how everything did, uh, kind of um, breaks down, okay? On the balance sheet, that's where we show our assets and our liabilities and our equity, whereas the income statement shows revenue and expenses. Cash flow really just shows how the cash is coming in and out of the business. So let's talk about these statements because they're something that you should be familiar with and they will help you run your business more effectively. So the first thing we talk about is the balance sheet. Okay. It's a snapshot at any point in time of the value of the business. So the basic equation up here is your assets always are going to equal your liabilities and your equity. Right? So that is why it's called a balance sheet, because it balances. Um, and I'm going to actually give out a sample, actually I, I don't have to give them out because Meta did my job for me, and in your packet you should see uh, something that looks like this, and these are some sample financial statements. Sunny Day uh, Family Child Care Center. <coughs> Anyone is calling their business Sunny Day, it's completely, it's completely, uh, um, you know, a coincidence. I'm not trying to steal your business name or anything like that. It's just something I, I uh, picked up here. Okay. So Sunny Day Financial or Family Child Care Center, as you can see on the first page, put together their balance sheet. And in the first year, these years are a little dated, um, 
we can call them 16 and 17 instead of 13 and 14. Um, as you can see, remember, we always list our assets in terms of the most liquid to the least liquid. And when we say liquid, it means how quickly they can get turned in, into cash. Okay? So cash is always the king um, in accounting. So uh, on top there, in, uh, in the first year, they have 8,903 in cash, and then they have $299 in accounts receivable. Okay? Do any of you folks bill your, uh, the parents of, of your children, or do they pay right up front? Right up front? Prepaid. Prepaid, okay. Does anybody ever bill, like, for after the fact, say, okay, you know, I provide the services, here's your bill? No? At the end Good. of the week. At the end of the week? I did some for the end of the week. Okay. Like, Monday to Friday, they, do, then they pay you on Friday. They pay you on Friday. Okay, so you're really not, you know, you're not extending them out. That's a good thing, actually, that you guys are smart. Um, <laughs> because once you start dealing with accounts receivable, it can get a little messy. You know, and I know sometimes you're dealing in your businesses with the, the human element. Oh, you know what? We had our furnace blew up, and can I, you know, can I pay you next week or something of that nature? And or you know, my husband lost his job, and he's you know currently looking for a new job. So you can get into those situations, but you have to remember when you do that, you're still running a business too, and you have your own bills to pay and, and things of that nature. So <coughs> be careful with the accounts receivable if you do extend people credit. Because what I learned as a business owner too is that you know. Once you extend someone credit once, they're going to take it more than once. Okay, they're going to, and then now you're forming a habit with your customers where they feel they can just pay you whenever they feel like paying. Mm -hmm. I, Essentially, I did, I did that. You did that? <laughs> I did that with the parents. And the father, he would pay sometimes, oh, two weeks, three weeks, and then less, what less year or two years ago, I used to do the pick up and drop off for the driver to come and pick her up. And he still owe me up until now. And I still haven't gotten the money. Yeah. Because it's still out there. I had to physically drop his daughter. Did not pick her up anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's how it stopped. Yeah. Because the bill was going on and when I keep writing the receipts and writing the receipts and I'm still holding on to the receipts. I still haven't gotten paid yet. Yeah. Yeah. I just got to tell the girl, I said, sorry, I'm your dad haven't paid for months, and I'm not going to do it anymore. Yep. So that morning she called me, I said, I can't pick you up, because your dad haven't paid this bill. And up to now that bill is in there, yep. and you just made the girl walk to school. It's a tough situation, too, that you're in, um, because you're dealing not with, not with products, but you're dealing with children. Um, and you might actually really like the children, you want to, you know, Help them, yeah. them. But, you know, unfortunately, sometimes you get into situations where parents, you know, um, don't pay or, I don't want to say take advantage, some might, some, some might have legitimate concerns, so it can become very sticky. So I think it's good that most of you are really getting the money up front and, and, and kind of training your customers as to what your payment terms are, okay? And you might lose, a, lose some people that way. Some people might just say, well, I don't want to prepay or whatever, but so be it. You know, you'll find somebody else. Some people disappear, they never come back. Yeah. I had a, a funny uh, story, it's a little unrelated, but I think it's a, an interesting story where a um, guy was, uh, I know, uh, he was a psychiatrist, and uh, you know, psychiatrists charge a lot of money or whatever, so he had a session with the kid or whatever, and uh, the parent was like, oh, well, I don't have my checkbook, can you bill me? He said, okay, so they leave, and you know, the kid actually left their book bag there, so he called them up and said, oh, you know, your kid left his book bag here. And they said, oh, we'll pick it up at another time. They, they, they didn't want to pay the bill, so they actually never came back to pick up the kid's book bag. You know, it probably had his school books in there, and who knows what. But people do strange things sometimes, and, and sometimes it's for a reason. Sometimes, you know, it, it's not. They're just trying to play games. So you have to be very careful with uh, accounts receivable. And it can get very tricky. Um, so that accounts receivable, because we expect to receive them, they're considered a current asset. Um, in your term, unfortunately, uh, Christine, they might be a long-term asset, but in this case, it's a, it's a current asset because you expect to get paid within 12 months. Uh, and that gives us total assets of 9,200. 
Then we go down to the other side of the equation and we look at the liabilities. Okay, and there's accounts payable of $153. And that could be a bill that's been waiting to be paid. Some credit cards payable of only $200. Good for them. And, um, and that gives them $350 uh, roughly in total liabilities. Now, because of this equation, the difference there has to be paid in capital. So they paid it $5,000 to start the business. They made $23,849 in the first year, but took out $20,000, okay? And that gives them total equity of 8849 And as you can see, the assets equals the liabilities plus equity. So that's one good way of saying, you know, looking at your business and saying, what kind of value do I have? What kind of assets do I have? What kind of liabilities are outstanding? And um, where do I stand? So if I were to say, based upon what we just talked about, if you were looking at Sunny Day and at the end of this first year, what the value of their business is, what, what would you tell me? Testing your room. 9,000? That's their total, that's their total assets. But remember, we want to say, we said the equity is their total value essentially of their business. So that would be the 8849. 843 and plus 8,000. right. Because basically if they took that $9,200 in cash, okay, or in assets, turn that all into cash, paid off the bills they have outstanding of the 353, they'd be left with the 8849, which is the equity. Okay, so that shows the value of their business at any point in time. So that's one way as a business owner we could always look at, you know, are we in good shape? What would it, what would we have if we walked away today? Let's say if they had a lot more debt, if they had, you know, ten thousand dollars in debt because they took out a loan from somebody, then they might have what's considered negative equity, which means I don't have enough assets to pay my bills. So I'm gonna have to, you know, either put some more money in or I'm going to have to extend some of those bills out or something like that. So it gives you a good you know, uh, analysis of what the value of your business is at any time, how many assets you have, and how they compare to your liabilities. Okay, and then if you look at the next year, um, they actually have, their cash amount has increased up to $14,000. They have some additional accounts receivable of 658, so their accounts receivable are going up. Okay, what does that tell you? If their if their accounts receivable are going up, why? Yeah, that's that's the question I would ask. Why? Does it mean somebody's not paying me? Like, unfortunately, in, in, in Christine's uh, example before, um, I'm sorry. Cheryl. Cheryl. Okay, you're behind Ed there. Ed, for the Cheryl, I am sorry for calling you Christine. <laughs> You, are you offended by the name Christine? I guess you like Christine, so I'm going with you. <laughs> 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 no problem. <laughs> I got to tell you, so having the name of Eric Peter, I can't tell you how many times people call me Peter. All the time I get it, emails and, well, hey, Peter, how you doing? It's not my name, but I'm doing all right. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, okay, and then in year two, it looks like sunny day, purchased some equipment, $2,000, okay? So let's call that uh, playground equipment, okay? They put in, you know, something that's uh, in the backyard, swing set, whatever it might be. Um, and then they have some accumulated depreciation on that because at the end of the year, that has a value less than when they first installed it, okay? Uh, it's depreciated in it. Um, so it now has a value to the business of $1,600. Looks like about 20% of it has depreciated. Um, they have some accounts payable still of $153, and then some credit card payments went up a little bit. Now they have $400 on their credit card. Still not too bad a shape. Okay. The $5,000 that they paid to start the business is still there as paid in capital. Uh, the retained earnings now have gone up to 5,886 and the owner's draw, which is accumulates over time. It's not just what they took out that year, it's the total that's been taken out is up to 40,000. 
So it looks like they're taking out consistently about $20,000 a year as their salary, as the owner's salary. And that gives us total owner's equity of 15886 So, Aparna, if I looked at year two and I said, what's the value of my business, what would you tell me it is? 16000 Excellent. Yes. Because, again, if I took my 16439 in assets, turned them all into cash, paid off the bills, I would be left with 15886 Okay? So, this is your basic balance sheet. And like I said, the trick of it is run at a specific point in time. You can run that today, you can run that you know, in, at the end of the month, at the end of the year. That will tell you how much assets you have, how many bills you have outstanding to pay, and what the value of your business is. Okay? It can also tell you if you're taking out too much money, I'll get to in a second. Oh, um, a question. Yeah, I'll get it in a second. If you're taking out too much money, you might be cutting into the value of your business a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you want, might want to manage that as well. Yes, your question, Aris. So, se supone que el balance final, the balance and the plan year, the mid year, the start, el, el balance inicial. So, el, el balance que termina final, el año. Uh, comienza el siguiente. Entonces, ese balance comienza el, el siguiente año. Exactamente, pero yo tengo una diferencia de cuatro mil y tanto de dólares. She says she's looking at the balance sheet, and your ending balance should be your beginning balance, and she seems to have a $4,000 difference. Um, from cash? Or from yes, from cash. Okay. Well, cash isn't always, your ending balance is not, but again, this is not the beginning balance here. This is the end of the year balance. Okay? So, as of January 1st, this would be my cash balance. But then other stuff happened during the year, which will change my cash balance. This is at the end of the year. So when you see the balance, you are seeing it from December 31, not from January 1. And Aris, I think once we when we get to the cash flow, that will make more sense. Okay, you'll see how the cash goes. But good question. Okay. Now, Eric, I wanted to ask for for the class: Is this what you guys look for when they apply for a loan? They have to produce a statement like this if they were to apply for a loan? They have to uh, usually produce a, um, a profit and loss, um, not always a balance sheet, but we would like a balance sheet because as a lender, what we want to do is if we're going to lend you money, we want to see how much debt you already have. So if you have a lot of debt and you're coming to us for more debt, we might say, we're not going to give you any money because all you're doing is accumulating debt and at some point, the dam's going to break and you're not going to be able to pay anybody back, mm -hmm. okay? So it is important for a lender's perspective to look at um, to look at how much debt and what kind of assets you have, okay? Are you leveraging yourself too much? Are you, are you, you know, spending too much and putting too much on credit cards and things like that? Um, because another, another uh, situation we get all the time when people call up for loans is they call up and they say, hey, I'd like a loan for my business. Okay, well, how much are you looking for? And if they actually give us a real answer instead of how much can I get, say $20,000. What do you need it for? Well, I've, uh, I've started my business and I've got a lot of bills and I've run out of money, so I'd like to borrow some money to pay off those bills. Our answer is usually, to your point, Lucretia, <laughs> not today. Because all that means is you're putting a Band-Aid on it and you're kind of using our money to then pay off loans and just shifting it around. What we want to do when we lend money to people is really to see how that can help their business grow and help them generate more revenues, not just kind of take care of the old debts that you already have. Okay? So that's that's one of the things we would want to look at. And yes, we would look to you know to determine how much debt and how you're running the business. So anything the more information you can give a lender, the better your situation is going to be. Yes, Kelly. Um, can you clarify the owner's draw? You said it's, it's accumulated. Yep. So for a period of time on business. Yep. So for example, in my situation, if I do twenty thousand a year, or for twenty five years, seventy five hundred thousand dollars. Correct. So that would put me well in the negative. Well, so no. What is that showing you? It, but you're also going to be accumulating the profit for those years too. So this, this uh, retained earnings is also a cumulative number. Oh. So let's say you okay. made 20, 
the thirty thousand dollars each year, and you took out twenty. Mm -hmm. So then that thirty after twenty-five years comes out to what seven hundred fifty thousand mm -hmm. minus the five hundred thousand. You will still be have increased the value of the business by two hundred fifty thousand. Is that it? Yep. These are, these numbers are all cumulative on the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that make sense? Does everyone understand uh, Kelly's question? Okay. Let's talk about now about the profit and loss statement. And let's go to page two of our study day family child care center. And, um, and it shows, it shows a year by year comparison. We'll just call them year one and year two here. Okay, so in year one, the first thing we want to show is our revenue. Okay, and they have two different forms of revenue. What are they? Coming from two different sources. Sorry? Infant and toddler. Infant and toddler. So why would I break out infants and toddlers? You charge differently yeah. for them, right? And it's good to track how much money you're making in each different category. Whether it's childcare or whether it's a different business, you always want to see, you know, am I making more money in this area or am I making more money in this area? And you track that by breaking out your revenues. Mm -hmm. So the infants and don't laugh at me if my numbers are way off. It's just an example. Uh, I have three infants that I'm caring for, and I'm charging them, the parents, $152 a week for 52 weeks. Okay? And that comes out to $23,712. Okay? I don't know if, if 152 is accurate, but no? Okay. Way too low? Okay. Maybe I'll adjust this for the next <laughs> class, though, based on your recommendation. For now, go with my example. Okay? And then I have two toddlers at 147 a week times 52 weeks, and that gives me 15,288. Okay? And as you can see, then that gives me total revenue of $39,000. And because I have those five children that I'm caring for, I have some direct expenses, some expenses that I'm incurring because I have them under my roof. They are some supplies as well as food. Supplies could be maybe specific diapers, formula, whatever it might be, as well as food um, for the kids, and that comes out to $4,160. Okay, so I get now what we call a gross profit. So I've made directly off of those children $34,840. Those are, those, that's my direct revenue, or what we call in the accounting world, gross profit. But I have some other incremental expenses that, um, that I have to pay to keep my business up and running. I have <coughs> utilities, which are gas and electric, of 1836 I have some telephone costs of $360. Maybe I have a separate line to be used just for the, for the business. Some equipment, some small equipment that I'm going to pay um, $400. Um, maybe I bought a fax machine or something like that. Um, payroll, okay, I can't handle five children, so I have to bring somebody in for a couple hours a day so I can do my bookkeeping or do whatever I might need to do, um, and I'm bringing somebody in for three hours a day, five days a week, uh, and, I'm, and uh, I'm paying them $825 an hour, and no. no. If that were the case, I'd be working you. $8.25 an hour, <laughs> okay? Um, and that gives me a total of $6,435, uh, $6, okay? Um, then I have insurance. I have to have some additional insurance for having the children in my house. Um, some bank charges, which is really just maintaining my checking account and things of that nature. Uh, some professional fees, $200. That could be having my accountant do my taxes for me. Um, then some, uh, some small maintenance and some uh, miscellaneous costs to give me total indirect expenses of $10,991 for that first year of operations. And that gives me a net profit of how much? $23,849. Not a bad first year. Okay? And if you go back to the balance sheet okay, for a moment and you look at your retained earnings number, how much is that? 
just the 23,849. So, so remember, what we talked about, our retained earnings is what we've made, the profits we've made in the business, okay? So that directly relates, since this is year one of the operations, mm -hmm. that 23,849 goes directly from there, and that's retained earnings. That's what, that's what the profits we've made in the business. So that's how that kind of holds together, okay? Going back to our income statement here, we look at year two. Now, what happens is I'm a savvy business owner, and I say, you know what? I have a lot of people that want to send their children to my, my child care center, but I can only have five, okay? So how can I increase my revenues? Well, if I have that much demand, you know, maybe I can raise my prices, okay? Because people really like me for some strange reason. So I raise my prices in year two. So in year two, I still have three infants, and uh, now I'm charging $167 a week. Times 52 weeks, that gives me $26,052. The toddlers, I also bumped up $15 an hour, so now I have two at $162 a week, times 52, and that gives me $16,848, and I've increased my revenues to $42,900. One of the things we have to think about, too, is that if we are handcuffed by how many children we can have, we can't all of a sudden say, well, I have so much demand, I can bring 10 kids in, because you can't, you know? You can, you're only limited to five, but maybe if there is that much demand, what I can do is I can charge a little more, and then, you know, I kind of weed out some of, some of the demand or whatever. You might lose some clients or customers that way, but, you know, if you have enough demand, enough people looking for child care services, it's, a, it's one way that you can actually increase your revenues. Okay? Yeah. Yes? I have a little question. Sure. I'm curious. Um, accounts payable on balance sheet. Yep. What is that? What would you prefer? So accounts payable would be, it could be like any type of bills you might have. It could be a, a utility bill that you've gotten in that you haven't paid yet. But, okay, but you know that's included in your, um, your expenses? Yes. Because what happens is when that expense comes in, let's, let's call it a utility bill, okay? I get a bill from pse and for $153, okay? And that's for the last months of service or whatever. So it's automatically an expense because I've already used those utility services, but I haven't paid it yet. So it's an account payable. So when I pay it, I'll reduce that account payable and pay it out of my cash, my bank account. So it actually is on both sides of that equation. Anything we do in accounting, we make two sides to the equation, okay? And each side goes into one of those buckets. So if it's, you know, if I get this bill in, and remember, our balance sheet is at a specific point in time, so you might have already incurred that expense, but you just haven't paid the bill yet, so it's showing out there as a liability, as something you owe, okay? Okay, so going back to here, so cost of supplies and food went up a little bit too, um, and now those direct expenses are 4,472 to give me a gross profit of how much for year two? Sorry? Maria, how much is my gross profit in year two? <coughs> That's year one. What's in the next year? The year that we say is 12, 31, 14. 34, 428. 38, 428. 38, 428. Right? So I made more, I have more gross profit in year two to pay my other expenses. And we still have the uh, utilities, we still have most of the same expenses. The poor person that's working for us, we didn't give them a raise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So they're still making that uh, 825 an hour. Uh, we have some insurance. We did, uh, there's one thing on here that's different though, which is depreciation. Because if you remember, we bought that equipment. And when we buy that, when we have an asset that we're going to depreciate that's gonna lose value over time, we expense a portion of that over the life. So we expense $400 uh, in the first year of operation. Uh, and that gives me total indirect expenses of 11,391 for a net profit of 27,037. So I'm doing a little better in year two. Mm -hmm. 
okay? I've maximized that and I've done it because I realized that I can't add more children, but you know what? My services are, are more valuable so I can charge a little bit more. And that comes out to 27037. So one thing I want you, you guys to look at, now go back to the balance sheet real quick. Remember, we said our retained earnings is what we've accumulated over time, and Kelly, this goes to the question you had before. So that now we have retained earnings of 5886, which if anybody has a smartphone or you can trust my math, that 50,000, that's the two years worth of net profit, the 23,849 and the 20 plus the 27,037. That's been our profitability over the two years. Can you do this sure. So at the end of year one, okay, I made uh, I made 23,849, right? Yep. And so that becomes my retained earnings. But it just comes. Well, but then in year two, I made 27,037, right? Oh, these two Those two together equal the 50,886. So we accumulate those over time, and that's what retained earnings is. It's all the profits we've made in the business over time. Okay, you, count every year. you count every year. Yep. I know. Correct. Yep. So you can kind of see how that holds together. Do we have any questions on this sunny day income statement? I know this is a lot and we're going through, but you know, I'm just trying to introduce you to a lot of these concepts. If you have more in-depth questions, like I said, don't hesitate to call or ask or anything like that. Okay, so we've shown now in two things. We've shown the value of our business on our balance sheet, and we've shown our profitability here, which is how well we actually make money. Both of these, to, to the question Ed asked before, both of these are important if you're going for a loan or anything like that, because we want to see not only how well you know your position in terms of debt, but how much money you can make. Because anytime somebody makes a loan to a business, they want to make sure the most important thing is how much they can pay it back. Do you have a question now? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? And if you need me to go back over anything, I'm happy, happy to do it. Okay. Let's talk now about our statement of cash flows. And a cash flow statement covers a specific period of time and it reports the cash generated and used during that period. So a statement of cash flow, the best way to think about it is think about your bank account. Okay? When you get money, you put it into your bank account. Okay? When you spend money, you usually take it out of your bank account so you have the money to spend. So that's your actual cash. Now let's say you write, you know, you put a bunch of money in, let's say you put $5,000 into your bank account, okay, but then you write, you know, three checks to people. Maybe you check to me, because I'm a nice person, check to Ed, check to Meta, um, and Ed and I, who are living, you know, <coughs> living on a thin margin, we go out and we, we cash those checks right away. Meta's independently wealthy, so she just holds on to that check. So in your bank account, even though you've written that check, it still shows that you have that money in the account. And that's the same way, same concept that a statement of cash flows work. How much money do you actually have? Um, and if you go to page three, we did a statement of cash flows for <coughs> sunny day financial statement. And it shows you the inflows of cash versus the outflows of cash. So let's look at the first year. We know in that the first year, it's the year ended, uh, in this case 2013, we had revenues of 39,000. Remember we saw that on our income statement, okay? But we also have account, we want to take out any new accounts receivable we have. Why is that? Because we provided the service for that person, we recorded as revenue, but we haven't received the money yet. Okay, so this is actually showing how much actual cash. 
So because I haven't received that money yet, I don't count that as cash. So I need to deduct that from the amount of revenues I show. Okay? And also in the first year, I as the owner put in $5,000 to get the business started. So I have total cash coming into the business of $43,700. And then I paid out a bunch of stuff. I paid out all those expenses I had shown there on, on the first page, my cost of goods sold, my utilities, my payroll, all down the line. But then I also say, but I had 353,000, wow, I'm getting killed on my thousands, $353 in accounts payable, which means I got the value of something, but I didn't pay it yet. So I still have that cash in my pocket. So I want to take that out of the equation. So I, re I uh, reduce it by that 353. And then I took out $20,000 as an owner's draw. It's not an expense because that's me taking my own money out of the business, but it is cash. So I paid out $34,798 in cash out of the business. And if you look at the, the bottom, and I think this is what you were talking about before, Aris, we have the cash inflow minus the cash outflow gives me a, a cash balance of 8,903. Anybody remember seeing that 8,903 number before? It's on your balance sheet. It's your ending cash balance, right? So that's how that equals in. It just shows the flow of the cash. And the same thing happens in the previous year, or in the next year, I should say. Um, Remember, so we start off with our, our revenue. Now that 299 in accounts receivable that was there at the end of the year, we collected that. So that's new cash, that's new cash coming in. But we also had new receivables of 658 at the end of the year, so we have to take that out because that's money we haven't received. Um, and then we go all the way down the line again. Um, we have our owner's draw again. And we also, remember, we purchased <coughs> fixed assets during the year. We purchased that playground equipment, so that's an additional $2,000 that we have to spend. And that gives us a total cash outflow of $37,263. So, Aris, to the point you were asking before, if you look at the bottom of that second year, what does it say my opening cash balance was? $8,000. Down at the bottom. Eight thousand nine hundred and three, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what it was at the beginning of the period I'm looking at, and then I had cash inflows, money coming in of forty two five forty one, which we see up top, money going out of thirty seven two sixty three, and that brings my ending cash balance to the fourteen thousand one eighty one, which is my cash number on my balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So that's how it rolls, like you were asking about before. Does that make sense? No, it's a, no I'm, I'm happy if it doesn't make sense to explain it more. Okay, I'm not gonna I'm not putting you on the spot. I just want to make sure I, you understand how that works. Okay. Um, so again, this cash flow statement really just shows the money coming in and the money going out. Okay. A lot of times it's very similar to our profit loss, but there could be other things in there. Like our owner's draw is not a part of our profit loss because we're taking equity out. This purchasing of equipment is not on our, on our expenses because we bought an asset. So to use that two-sided equation, when I went out and bought that playground equipment, I gave them a check for $2,000, so I reduced my cash, and I increased my asset by $2,000 because I bought an asset that's going to have a benefit to the company. So it balances out two sides of the equation. Does everybody uh, see that or have any questions? Okay. Um, talk a little bit more about the cash flow cycle. Now, you folks are very impressive. You're very good in the way you collect your funds. But basically, cash works in this type of a cycle, okay? So basically, what you want to do is you have the materials or, or the labor 
used to produce your, your in this case, your service. Mm -hmm. So it's your costs, and then you turn that into something you bill out to your customer. Okay, the customer that actually creates an account receivable. So let's use an example. Okay, if I if you guys were all if I said ah it's just a joke this isn't a free class I have you're going to pay for it. Okay, so you're all going to pay me five hundred dollars. So what I would do is I would spend my time teaching the class, okay, and then when you leave today, I'm going to give you all a bill for $500. I'm really going to do that, just an example. Uh, and that creates, now I have an account receivable from each one of you for that $500. So that's nine people in the class. I'm owed $4,500. And eventually, you're going to pay that, and that's going to turn into cash, which then I'll use to get buy more materials or put on more workshops or things like that in order to keep making money. So that's the cycle of, of the cash flow. Does that make sense? In your, in your case, you would, if you would provide services for the kids, then you would bill the parents, and I know most of you are not doing that, which is great. Uh, then they might owe you that money, and eventually you're gonna turn it into cash. One of the key things to a, a business is to how quick you can make this cycle. Okay, because the quicker you can take your products or services and turn them into cash, the better situation you're going to be in. I'll tell you a little story. So when I, uh, I left the corporate world and I, I owned my own uh, business, and um, one of the things that I did is um, the previous owner, he had, a, you know, he had a bunch of accounts receivable, people that owed him money. So I said, okay, when those checks come in, We'll just give it all that money over to you. Well, what I didn't take into account was this owner of this business, he was not very good about collecting his receivables. He let people pay whenever they want. So these were now my customers. So I was. they came in, they ordered more work for me. Um, it was a printing company, you know. And then, you know, they wouldn't pay for like 60 days or, or whatever. So I, I'm a brand new business owner and I'm doing all this work, paying all my bills, and I'm not receiving that money for 60 days. So I had a serious cash problem, you know, because where's that cash gonna come from? I still gotta keep the operations running, but these people were paying me very slowly. So that creates a big problem, and that's something, as business owners, we have to be, we have to be uh, careful about. Yes, is it nice? Uh, because you know these people to say, sure, you can pay me whenever, but like we, we said before, sometimes people will then, that will be the expectation, and we have to be very careful of how much leeway we give our people. Okay. Have any of you ever gotten asked by people to, hey, could I pay you, you know, later or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. well, yeah. What, what, Single what? mom and two weeks later, she two weeks and disappeared. Yeah. I think somebody over here mentioned that too. Yeah, Cheryl. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I That's got you right. why I prepay. Prepay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what if somebody comes to you and says, oh, I can't prepay or anything like that? You tell them you can't watch the children. That's yeah, the policy. Yeah, you don't watch the child until they're paying you. It's a $10 fee per day, and after four days, the child's gone. Yep. And um, I have a security that I get up front, and they lose that. That's good. That's a good business practice. It's, it's important we train our customers. Um, you know, we need to actually make sure it's very black and white, and you have to kind of take the personal relationships out of it, which it sounds like, Kelly, you're doing a fantastic job at, and just say, look, this is a business. These are our policies, our terms. If you can't comply with them, then, you know, I suggest you, you would find a different provider to, uh, to watch your children. It sounds a little cold, but like I said, if they get into that habit of then, okay, well, I'll pay a week late, and then, oh, that's okay, then the next time it becomes two weeks, and the next time it becomes three weeks, or never, in your case, um, and it, and that's essentially your money. You've done the work, you know, you, you're entitled to that money. So it's important to um, to really manage those accounts receivable. Yes? If you work with a contract, you will build all this out. Parents respect that. Yep, absolutely. They have a confidence in you knowing that you run business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes some people, I find a lot of abuse, like, say, like a babysitter. Mm -hmm. yep. They pay you anything. They don't feel as though you're running a business. 
even though you let them know this is a business, they will still say, bye. You're just it's a babysitter. babysitter. She's my babysitter. You know, yeah, so they just pay you like, ah, uh, maybe 30, 40 dollars or whatever. Yeah. I, I don't even have private customers right now. Most of the customers that I have are um, by state checks. Okay. So it makes it even better for you because you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Right. Exactly. If they said, well, they have to pay a copay, you have to pay a copay. Mm -hmm. If you don't have to pay a copay, well, that money just goes in the bank for you and you don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. And I find it much better. Absolutely. <coughs> um, and I, I, I think Kelly's model is a good one. And the more you can put in black and white, then yes. there's, there's no opening for I'll have them sign to it. So yep. you have an agreement to hold them to. Yep. They can't yeah. say, well, I do not. Cheryl, let me ask you a question about the state pay. How many people have uh, children that are getting state pay or, or some kind of subsidy for a couple? Okay. Um, so how quickly do does the state pay? Every two weeks. Every, Every two other weeks. week. Okay. Every other week. So you still have a little bit of a cash um, cycle there because you're, you're still waiting for two weeks in some cases to get paid. So that does put a little bit of, of strain on you sometimes. Um, waiting for that check and I know the state's going to pay and they're usually pretty consistent about how, how much they pay but for a small business especially if you're starting out you have that's the stuff you have to kind of know up front is to just say you know what how quickly can you pay you know or, or what are the terms and define as much as you can in black and white okay? and sometimes you know you might have, did you do your own contract Kelly write it up or yeah, but over the years, I, you know, took information from one of sources, yep. and I kept changing it as I found I needed to. Sure. Um, yeah, and you adapted it. And, and you know what? Those contracts might not even be legally enforceable, but sometimes people just respect having something in place, and they say, you know, here's, I have to do this. So, um, so it's, it's a good way to train and manage your customers. You know, the thing I, I always laugh about, there's a couple examples that are very common where um, people <coughs> abide by the rules that the rules aren't even enforceable. Do you ever see a sign that says no soliciting? Okay. They don't have the right to do that. You know, that's just, they, they, companies will come out and put that out there because they don't want to be bothered. So any salesperson can go in at any time. There's no law that says you can't walk in and solicit from a business. They just put that out there to deter people away. And usually when people see that, they say, oh, no soliciting, I can't go in there. I can't try to sell what I'm trying to sell. The other one that always gets me is the credit card fees, when you see a $10 minimum on a credit card fee. <coughs> they are legally not allowed to do that, to put a minimum on a credit card fee. That's right. <laughs> yeah, but people say, oh, no, it's only, it's under $10, so I can't use my credit card. Sure you can. Nobody just wants to challenge that because they put up a little sign. Okay? So things like that, people get trained and people get, you know, into a mode, and that's an important thing as a business owner to really make sure your customers understand what your terms are and that, you know, what the consequences are if they're not willing to follow your terms, okay? I'm not going to be able to watch your kid. I'm sorry. This is my policy. It's nothing personal. You know, now it's just business. You don't want to get into a situation where it's a, a personal, you know, fight or anything like that with people, and the more stuff you can have in black and white makes it more like a real business and where people will really respect it more to, to you. Right. And also to piggyback off what everyone was saying, some people actually put into their contracts if you're late, then I'm going to charge you $5 for every five minutes you're late or something of that nature. So sure. I, I think um, the more you write down, like you said, it's more of a respect thing. Mm -hmm. yep. They're less likely to fall. Oh, away from that and it's your money you know you've actually done the work so you know it, you're entitled to it um, but people people like to you know play games sometimes and, and, and you want to reduce as much of that and you want to be very careful with who you extend terms to and, and things like that okay when I used to my customers I used to extend terms to but when they wanted term we, they were COD until they asked for terms and then we would say, okay, now fill out and give me three references and things like that. So now it became like, okay, well, they're really serious about this and they're gonna follow up with me if I don't, you know? So it kind of trained them to 
okay, if we are going to give you terms, now I have to pay by this term, or else, you know, they're going to add interest on, and, you know, it's, it's legitimate. It's not just like, oh, sure, pay me when you want to. Because if you tell people that, I remember as a business owner, I paid the vendors that were, were calling me, you know? If they called me right away and said, hey, uh, when am I getting my money? Oh, I better pay this one. But this person isn't calling me, and I don't have the cash, so I'll put them off a little bit longer. It's human nature, right? And we have to do what we have to do sometimes. So it's good to get your uh, good habits with your, uh, in this case, the parents of, of the children. And uh, yeah, you can you can get into some sticky situations. I had to sue somebody one time to collect money. Um, it was actually uh, somebody who was running for office. Um, they were running for in like a, a, a mayoral race in town and uh, it was going to be in like three days the race was coming up. So I was a printer. So they came in and they said, hey, we need to get a late push out. We need to get all these flyers done. You know, I think it was like 10,000 flyers about this guy. We're going to hand them out, uh, but we need them by tomorrow. I said, okay. So we did it. You know, we did all the proof. The guy who was the candidate came in. He said, yeah, this looks good. Signed it or whatever. And then, you know, we, my business partner and I, we worked to like midnight and when I came in early the next morning to just finish it up and I had a call on my answer machine from the guys whatever chief of staff or whatever he was a campaign manager is a better word said oh we decided we're not going to do that so we don't need them I called them up and said oh yes you do whether you need them or not you're gonna pay for them and they refused to pay and the problem with that is that once an election's over if they're paid for by the campaign for so-and-so that person doesn't exist anymore if you lost there's no more funds available so uh, we have to take the guy to court um, and we won but it was not fun it took a lot of my time and effort anyway okay so um, once we have looked at our financial statements now what we want to do is we want to think about what they're telling us okay we now took all of our expense, or all of our costs of our business, all of our transactions, we put them into their appropriate buckets, we made financial statements out of them, and now we want to say, well, what is this really telling you? What do these things mean? Um, and, uh, and let's think about that for a little bit. Now, one thing that um, you're going to run into here is that unless you are using a program like I know Kelly said she's using Quicken or some other type of QuickBooks or whatever it might be, uh, it's going to be hard to produce your own financial statements. Um, so, you know, it probably is beneficial to you if you're serious about understanding your business more to invest in some type of a program. Um, QuickBooks, I know, is a very popular program. Again, I don't advocate any specific program because I think you have to find one that's um, good for you. But QuickBooks is used by like 99% of small business owners. And Quicken is a version of QuickBooks. Um, but there are other versions out there. And that way, the ease of it is, is that if you want to look at a balance sheet, you can just hit a little report button that says balance sheet, and it will give you everything, and, and you'll be able to look at it. Um, relatively inexpensive. I think you can get a basic version of QuickBooks for Ed, do you know, like maybe $20 a month or something? Or yeah, it depends. Uh, or you could get older versions. I mean, for the type of business you guys are running, you could get the QuickBooks, like 2014, 2013, and you could get that super cheap, $25, $30, yep. and that will run your profit and loss and your balance sheet. And it's good to have that just so you can see how well your business is doing. What you don't want to do is really figure that out once you finally give all the information to your accountant. And it, you know, he puts it all, or he or she puts it all together because that might be too late. And as business owners, we want to be able to react quickly to what, you know, our, our business is telling us and really look at the information um, so it's meaningful to us. So, you know, and if you have any questions about, uh, you know, um, buying something like that or getting it set up, I'd be happy to, we'll be happy to help you with that. I. Probably I go to clients all the time and help them set up their QuickBooks and get it all in shape. Um, and the, you know the, the the better you can do, and it's actually pretty easy. Uh, those programs are really designed for non 
accountants to do their bookkeeping. Uh, so they're very user friendly and they're very easy to use. I'm assuming you've had pretty good experience using Quicken, right? It's pretty easy. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it works well. But I gotta um, ask something which is gonna ask later when we got into these forms, but if you're talking yep. about reports, mm -hmm. um, indirect expense, 20% of my house, you know, so I'll take 20% of my utility bill or 20% of my mortgage or, or whatever for the business to give you an idea of how much the business is making or losing, then you could do that. It might be a different treatment for taxes, which we'll talk about later, but it will give you an idea as to am I making money or am I not making money. But I wouldn't pay that out of my business checking You wouldn't necessarily pay it out of your business checking so account. You'd just be recording it here so you could see how well the business is doing. Right, no, no, I understand that, but then it wouldn't be generated anymore. It's likely to be more than it can. Yeah, well, but, but you don't, you can make it like a non-cash expense, you know, uh, something like that. I can I can talk to you more in, in detail about that, but you would want to actually uh, see, because, you know, you want to understand that um, you know, because I'm running this business, you know, it has a certain amount of expenses or whatever, and, Am I really making it? Am I charging enough to the clients or things of that nature? So what would it cost? Or if you've been doing it for a period of time, you could also say, I know this is what I'm going to be able to, you know, expense out. And you can kind of, you know, put that onto your income statement to say, here's my, my cost, so I'll know, you know if I'm charging enough or if I'm making enough money. So, yeah, we can talk about that further. Okay. So let's talk about some things on your financial statements that will help us make better decisions as business owners. Okay? One thing we want to we want to look at, which is critical, is what's called our break-even point. Okay? A break-even point is really the, the point where we generate enough revenue to cover the costs of the business. And the calculation is as follows. So you take your indirect expenses divided by your gross profit percent. We'll go through it in detail in a minute. Uh, and gross profit percent is calculated as gross profit divided by the revenues. Okay. So uh, a break-even point is important because we have to see like how much money do we have to generate to make this business really make sense. Okay. If you determine, and we'll calculate this in a second, that I need to make Twenty thousand dollars in revenue in order just to cover all the costs of this, then um, of this business. Then, if you are only making eighteen thousand dollars or seventeen thousand or something like that, you might want to say, you know what, this business doesn't pay to run at this level. Maybe I need to increase what I'm charging to people, or maybe I need to, you know, add another child if I'm capable to do that. If I have less than five. Um, or something of that nature to make the business um, um, make a profit for you. Okay? You don't want to be in a situation where you're actually losing money. So let me show you how we calculate this. So if I want to say my gross profit percentage, and let me go to um, my handy dandy <laughs> little calculator here. Mm -hmm. So I have, who wants to tell me, let's look at year one. Okay, on my on my profit and loss statement. Okay, I'm going to go back to that for a minute. How much gross profit did I make? Which again is on my revenues minus my direct expenses. What's that number? Thirty-four. Thirty-four 
840, okay? And that was profit on $39,000 worth of, of revenue. So I take 34,840 divided by 39,000. And that gives me roughly 89%. So for every dollar I make, I have 89 cents that goes to pay all my other costs of running my business. Okay, because 11 cents of that is tied up in the direct costs related to generating that, that revenue. Okay. So then if I say, well, I have 10,991, I have so many of my kids' games on this phone, it drives me nuts. I can't <laughs> find my own things. 10,991. And I keep getting these alerts that like there's a Pokemon over here and stuff. I don't even know what's going on. But, um, okay, so if I take 10,991 divided by that 0.89, which is my gross profit percentage, that tells me I have to make $12,349 in revenue in order to cover all the costs of my business. Okay? So, $12,349 in revenue. What did I make the first year in revenue? That top line up here. 39. 39, right, 39. So $39 is obviously more than the $12,349, correct? So I'm making money. Now, if my revenues, let's say if I, if, you know, three of these kids were siblings and they moved away and uh, you know I only had two and my revenues dropped below that 12349 now I might have a problem so what do I do well I either add new kids okay either yep increase what I'm charging those four remaining two kids or <laughs> Yeah. Hey, sorry, I lost three kids, so now you're paying four hundred dollars a week instead of uh, three fifty-two. Yeah. That probably wouldn't go over well because then you'd have no kids. Um, or you can also go back and think about your expenses and what can I cut out, and maybe change that equation a little bit, and less costs you have to cover. So if I were to lose those that family of three, uh, that family of triplets, um, well, one thing I could probably cut out is my payroll. Because now I don't have five kids, I can handle two kids by myself, so I can reduce six thousand four hundred thirty-five dollars of expenses there. Or maybe I can cut back on some other things to make that equation work a little bit. Maybe increase them. A little I just bit. had that. I just lost three kids. Triplets. Moved to Texas now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but just as I lost the three, I moved three right into that swap. Yeah. Before That's I could have moved them out. I could have moved three right into the spot, so I didn't even have a problem with it. Do any of you that's folks have like a wait list or anything like that? Yeah? That's 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 lucky for you. You know, the problem with anything with like a wait list though is obviously those people need to find some kind of child care. Yeah, they don't want to wait. Yeah, they don't want to wait. They're going to grab what they can get. They're going to grab what they can get. You'll have waiting lists maybe for a daycare, but not for in-home child care. Well, you never know though, because if, if you think about it, you know, if I, let's say if I have my two kids, okay? And I say, I would really like to go to Aris's, uh, you know, have Aris watch my kids. She already has five. So Aris says, you know what, I'll put you on the list. Now, in the meantime, you know, I still have to do, I have to work, so I have to do something with my kids. So maybe I say, well, I'll go to Ed's, Ed's uh, home for child care. You know, I really don't want to go to Ed. I'd rather go to Aris. No offense, Ed. Uh, <laughs> but, um, so then maybe, you know, when Aris has two spots open up, I'll move that, you know? So you could still have a kind of a working list. They may or may, they may drop off or they may say, you know what, I'm really happy with Ed. He didn't have a great reputation. Once they start so many reps, lots of times you lose that customer. Because people don't like change, right? Yeah. You know, they don't like change. Kids already get used to being at that one spot, so. Yep. They make friends. Change them all over, get friends. And, yeah. yeah. But it, it is good to have some kind of a, you know, a backup or a wait list to, to add those things in. They don't give us all of that leeway in the home providers situation. In a daycare center, they do, and they pay more for daycares than they pay for in-home. And I think in-home do much better 
for oh, yeah. kids because you personalize your treatment to each kid that they do in a center and they pay much more for a center than they pay you for yes. Yeah, yeah. That's it's another easier. thing that we need to fight mm -hmm. for. It's easier to keep track of. I, I can tell you, one of the worst calls I ever got was when I had my kids, my kids were in a center-based daycare um, in our town. And um, we got a call one day and said, yeah, we're not really sure where Nick is. Oh. And I said, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> and they said, well, we all went out, you know, onto the, the playground. It was a fenced-in little playground or whatever. And we came back, when we did the head count to come back in, he wasn't in line. So I said, well, okay, this is a problem. So I'm, I had a heart attack. Thank God they got to me before they got to my wife. We were really one thing that had a big problem. So they said, they said, all right, you know, we're we're looking all over the place. So then I, you know, I was I hung up. I'm in a panic. I'm getting closing down. My, I'm getting ready to leave. They called me back. They said, oh, we found him. He was hiding under the slide, playing a joke on, on us. I'm like, well, it's not really a joke because right? I almost had a heart attack. You don't call a parent first. You try to find that kid. Before so, you call that period. if you see this like sprinkling of gray hair, that's the day <laughs> that this happened. Okay. So, I would do that. I would but to your point, yes, yeah, sometimes a smaller amount is manageable, but it also has a bigger problem because if you were now in, in my example, this um, sunny day, you know, they're very good in terms of their break-even point. But if you're if you were much closer, you know, and you have one child leave whether they go to you know uh, preschool or whether they move or whether whatever happens happens you know that could put you from being profitable <coughs> into not being able to cover your costs so it's something you have to think about and not just think about am i making money okay everything's good but what would happen if i lost you know one or two or something like that how would i manage that okay and until if you don't know some of these types of uh, information about your business you might not be able to plan for those type of, of events. So. Yes, my, my son thought he was being very funny. But he wasn't. Kids play those little games. Kids play games. those games. That's absolutely right. <laughs> okay. Another thing we want to think about is what's called a current ratio. Okay? A current ratio is in general and quick measure of how liquid you are. Okay, it makes a, a safety or cushion available to the credit. When we say liquid, liquid in this sense means how easily it is for you to pay your bills. So how much money do you have on hand to pay the bills that are coming due? So we want to look at what's called a current ratio. So in this case, a current ratio is our current assets divided by our current liabilities. And why, why does this make sense? Well, we, if you remember, we talked about before, current assets are things that are either cash or can quickly be turned into cash, okay? So that's what, what we consider how much available funds we have. And current liabilities we defined as something that's coming due in a relatively short period of time. So if we look at our <coughs> balance sheet, if we go back to our balance sheet, page one of our little sunny day handout, Okay, we have um, total current assets, let's look at the first year, of how much? 9,202. Okay, you guys are getting good now, you're picking up good stuff. Um, and then we had total current liabilities of how many? 353. So what, we, what this is telling us is we have $9,200 of, of money that's quick to pay off $353 worth of liabilities. Is that good? Yeah. Yeah, because that, I'm not even going to calculate it, but it's it's pretty high. We could pay those bills off a lot, you know, many times over, um, 300 times over or whatever. Um, so we're in good shape. Okay? What we want to be careful of is if we had, let's say that that those current liabilities for some reason instead of being 353 were 9,353 and we had 9,200 of, of current assets what would that tell us what's that you're not doing very good because you don't have enough available funds 
pay off the bills that are coming due. So that might mean that might show you a situation where you might have to either put more money into the business, or you might have to, um, you know, uh, collect on some on some things, or, or find an alternative route to uh, get the cash available to pay those bills. Okay, because again, you know, I'll go back to the example I used before. If um, if Lucretia called me up and says, well, I have a lot of bills coming due and I'm a little light on cash, can you lend me money? What's my answer, Lucretia? No. Not today. <laughs> That's gonna be our motto for this yeah. class, not today. Um, so yes, because now it means that you've mismanaged your money and I'm certainly not gonna bail you out because then you're gonna mismanage the money I lend you too. Yep. Yep. So you have to really be on top of that. Um, so saying a current ratio, usually people say if you have about a two to one ratio, um, which in this case, let's say if we had two to one, we could have $4,600 in current liabilities and 9,200 of current assets. That means we could pay those bills off twice. That gives us enough cushion if something else comes up. So two to one is usually pretty good. Okay, remember though, our current assets, part of that is things like our, our accounts receivable, okay? When could a current ratio, a high current ratio be bad? Does anybody have any ideas? Let's say this was reversed. Let's say I had $299 in cash and $8,903 of accounts receivable. You don't know when you're getting paid because if you have that much receivable standing out there chances are you might not be getting paid you at might all not even get paid. right and again back in my uh, in my experience when i was extending terms to customers i had people stiff me i had churches i had obviously politicians i had people you would never expect not pay their bills okay so you have to be i, I hate to keep going back to that point but you have to be very careful about it so yes, if I had a high degree of receivables, even though my current ratio might be looking good, it might mean that I have dead money there, I'm never gonna collect that, and I might not be able to pay my bills. So you still have to watch that. You know, another thing that would be a current asset would be something like inventory. So if I had, you know, maybe I made a blue t-shirts or something for my, uh, for my um, students or something like that, saying, um, you know, Sunny Day Family Child Care Center, you know, yellow with a big sun or something like that. Um, and I was going to sell them, but Ed told me, Ed's a t-shirt manufacturer, and he said, if you buy 5,000 of these, you know, I can give you a great deal on them. They'd only be $2 a shirt. Sounds good. Here's your, here's your, you know, $10,000, $10, Ed. Well, now I have 5,000 worth, or $10,000 in my inventory. I only have five kids. <laughs> How quickly am I going to blow through that inventory, right? So I might have tied up a lot of money there, and that might show. It still would be showing as a current asset because the inventory is, is current. But I'm not, going to, I'm not going to recognize the cash on that for a long, long time. So that could throw me off too. So we have to be careful about how we're spending our cash and what we have available to actually pay off all of our, our bills. Okay? But a current asset is um, is actually a good indicator of, of how much we could um, we could pay that off. An even better one might be um, to look at. They also have something that's called a quick ratio, which in this case it's the same. But um, a quick ratio just takes your cash and accounts receivable. It doesn't take things like inventory or anything else, and just uses that to show how much you can pay those. But it's pretty much the same. Because I would assume not many of you have inventory or anything like that. Nobody's bought t-shirts from that, right? Good. Okay. Stay away from him. He's a shady guy. He's a discount. You give a discount? Okay. Okay. Another thing we want to talk about is a debt to equity ratio. Okay? And a debt to equity ratio. It's, it shows how much we're borrowing versus how much we've invested into the business. So it's basically calculated by total liabilities divided by owner's equity. In this case, again, our total liabilities are still only that $353. 
okay? And our equity is 8,849. So we have a very low debt to equity, okay? That's a good thing. Um, when that debt to equity becomes very high though, or when it becomes, you have more debt than you have invested into the business, it can be a red flag because it means you're borrowing too much money to run your business. And therefore, as we talked about before, at some point there could be a tipping point. There could be you know, a point where the dam breaks and you won't be able to pay off all those debts. I know as lenders um, that you know, uh, we, if, if we see one that has uh, you know, higher than like 1.1, which would mean you have you know, for every $10 of, of equity in the company, you have $11 of debt. You know, anything above that is we won't even talk to you because it means you're borrowing too much money. It's good to borrow money, but it's also good to have a balance there as to what you're investing in the business and what you're retaining in the business versus just constantly you know, borrowing from other sources to run the business. So it really only comes into play, but you know, when you're looking for lending or financing opportunities, but um, you know, it is, it is important to uh, understand that, how, how much have I borrowed. Has any of you ever had borrowed money for your businesses or anything like that? Yeah? From us? Really? I didn't know you were a, uh, you were a former client. Former or current? Former. Former. Okay, good. Hope it was a good experience. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what, uh, if you don't mind me asking, what did you use the funding for? Bills, because I lost four kids. Okay, so it was more like a temporary thing yeah. that you had to. Yeah. Okay, so you just ruined everything I said about don't call us if you're. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you know, and and so the process you have to go through, and they, we probably, I'm sure, asked you for all of that type of information, correct? You know, your your profit and loss, your tax returns, and things like that. It was a special program. I qualified where I normally wouldn't have because I don't show, you know, I mean, you can get into that, but I don't show that I make that much money every year because I can write off the Right, yep. So, mm -hmm. it's difficult to get. It's difficult, yeah, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the what they say is, and, and, you know, the easiest time to borrow funds is when you don't need them, okay? Mm -hmm. Because when you do need them, you're usually in a less uh, attractive financial situation. So if you if you folks are thinking about you know maybe expanding maybe re uh, renovating the space that you're you know running um, the childcare operation out of or buying some uh, equipment you know um, playground equipment or, or things like that and you're looking for funds it's it's good to you know plan that ahead and determine when you're in a good position that you can say I'm ready to go get some some funds to do that and it's actually good to borrow money because then you pay that back and it helps your credit. You know? It helps your personal credit as well as you know, any business type credit you would have. It shows a positive repayment history, providing you intend to pay it back. And that you all would. Um, so it's actually good if you are looking to, and not just even expand to a center base, but even just increase you know, what you're trying to offer to people, um, you know, that would be a good thing. I have another question actually. How many of you folks advertise um, for your business, to do any type of advertising, yeah? What type of advertising do you do? I do yard signs. You do yard signs, saying, you know, your daycare, what's the name of your daycare? Mine is uh, Rising Stars. Rising Stars, okay. As long as it's not sunny day, we have a problem there. <laughs> um, rising, so you'll put out, you know, Rising Stars yeah, daycare. And, um, I just started. Okay. A few months ago. Okay. So and has that been successful for you? Do people see the sign to come in? Yeah. Yeah. Very, like, kind of. Okay. <laughs> what are some other forms of, uh, some other people do? Flyers. Flyers and things like that. Right. Yeah. Lucretia, what do you do? Community boards at like Shop Shop. Right. Yep. It's a lot of community-based advertising mm -hmm. because, you know, I'm not going to drive from Morris County there to drop my kid off. People want convenience. They want it to be. That type of thing. Anybody else do anything different? Hey, Kelly? Business cards. Business cards? Handing out business cards? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and where do you hand them out? Just uh, to the, especially to the parents. So 
so they can be <coughs> like referral type thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Do you do any type of a referral? Hey, if you refer to me, I'll give you a week free or something like that. Or no, I do. I do that. Yeah, yeah. And that would be good in a situation where Cheryl, like what you were talking about, is if um, you know all of a sudden you lost three kids because they moved to Texas, and now you know, hey, you might want to take that little bit of of a hit. But if you have other parents that you know and that you you know have had a good relationship with, that's a good way to say, hey. Refer some. I have spots available. If you refer somebody over, you know I'll give you a week free or whatever it might be. Um, community child care. Once you register as a child care provider, okay. mm -hmm. they advertise for you, and that really works for me. It's great. I don't do any kind of other advertising. Yeah. Because people go on the website, and right away they see you, and they decide, okay, five, six people. I'm gonna choose this one. Yep. Or I'm gonna choose that one, and then they go for interviews. Yep. And they decide whoever do the best interview, they stay with you. Yeah, and that's most of the times where I get my kids from. Yeah, that's great. I don't do nothing else. I was actually thinking, to be honest with you, more in the private pay, uh, mm -hmm. from a private pay perspective than from, yeah, if you have the ability to do that. And don't get that too many private pay customers these days. Where where are you based at? I'm in, I was in Old Bridge, mm -hmm. and I had like um, private pay customers with a bit before and after school care kids to drop them off and pick them up. Yeah. But actual child care, okay. everybody goes through community child care for help. Okay. So you end up getting a check from the state. Some people don't take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's on the pay, but, okay. you know. Anybody else do anything different, Kelly? Mine are all private pay. Um, yep. There's online directories. Okay. They're free, like they care bear, care.com, use those. Right. Um, Facebook groups, so the Facebook groups like Bradford Mom. Good, yeah. Um, that really helps. And my business Facebook page. Okay. A lot of people, when people do a search, yep. work it right, mm -hmm. they, uh, they see me. Yeah. No, and it's, it's funny because different methods work in different types of communities, too. Yes. You know? um, so and it's, it's really, it's really important to hit like the, the hyper local for your type of business too. So like the yeah the the uh, community groups online or even just you know if there's a um, you know events in town or whatever you could go and posting signs or whatever it might, uh, business cards or whatever business it might cards. be. Yeah. You know, um, now those those uh, those online groups you mentioned do they do any type of vetting of you or no. anything? No. No. They have, uh, requirements mm -hmm. as far as when you yep. have a child or yep. you have to live in that town to have a child. Okay. But um, there's so many different towns that are yes. close enough. Right. Yeah. You're, you're in a very um, accessible area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. 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 Um, Another thing we want to talk about when we look at our statements is kind of also projecting our cash flow. Because uh, we want to, like we talked about, see to make sure we have enough money available. Um, and one of the things we want to talk about, or we've been talking about, is we want to try to avoid that situation where we get an unexpected expense or loss of revenue and we're kind of hamstrung. You know, so we want to kind of project out, like, how is our cash going to look? So we want to just uh, remember, um, show you the cash flow cycle and how quickly we can turn our products and services into cash. And we can do that with a, with a little bit of an equation, too, okay? So if we take our opening cash and we add, uh, you know, what we're anticipating in cash sales, okay, and any outstanding receivables we might be collecting, and then what are my direct costs going to be? What are my operating costs going to be? And that would give me my ending cash. And if my ending cash is going to be a shortfall, then we could say, what would I need to do to fill that gap? And you can even, you can even um, kind of manipulate this a little bit, whereas you could say, here's my opening cash. Here's what I anticipate in cash sales. Okay, but what if two kids dropped off? Maybe I lower that number. And, uh, and then see where my equation comes out to. Because if it says that, you know, if I lose these two kids, I would still have, a, have an okay, 
I would still be okay in terms of the cash position, uh, then I know I don't need to panic and put additional money in or anything like that. I could take my time to, to fill those spots or to get a referral or do something like that. Um, but if, you know, if we say, okay, if I drop down to three kids and that would put me in a cash shortfall, well, then I better plan ahead for that, you know, and what I would do in that situation. Maybe have like a wait list or maybe, you know, in, in Cheryl's uh, situation where you have, you know, you could go back to the child care agency and say, okay, I have a spot open. Is that what you do if someone No, they just look in the, on their website. They have a website. Yeah. Okay. Have you look, um, they um, see where the child care providers are located. Yep. If you just move into an area, that's the first thing people do. They go to the website mm -hmm. and they will yep. look to see where are you located. If you're close by or you're 10, 15 minutes away. Right. Or you're close by the school. For instance, sometimes some parents will come to you and say, well, you know, I like to have child care. But I don't have a pick up and drop off. It depends on what school the kid is going to. Might say, well, but do you do a pick up or a drop off? Uh -huh. Or sometimes they would say, well, I have to be at work at such and such a time. What time are you open? Right. Because some daycares are open later than some. Some mm -hmm. early starts early, some starts late. Like I always say, my main goal is to satisfy the parents. Yep. So I work, it depends on how many parents I would have. Let's say I start at 6.30 mm -hmm. in the morning, and I will go up to at least about 8 or 8.30 at night. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem no. with that. Because I work with the parents. Everybody don't have a 9 to 5 job. Yep. And if parents don't have a 9 to 5 job, you tell them, why close at 5? Well, I'm not, I can't take your kid. Then you lose business. Yeah, sure. So I always keep business because I'm open early and I close late. Okay. So I always have this. And I accommodate sometimes for parents who work on weekends. Wow. Uh, Saturdays, I will help out kids on Saturdays. Sometimes you have parents who work overnight. Mm -hmm. I help them do for overnight. Wow. I charge for that. So yes. I'm tired just listening to you. <laughs> um, I personally work at night. I have a job. Yeah. I supervise at night. Next year will be 30 years. Since I'm working nights and I still run my daycare, but I get help with my daycare. Okay. So you pretty have, much I subsidize. You have somebody working with you? Yeah. Oh, okay, that's yeah. why. Mm -hmm. When you by yourself, you're going to do that. No. <laughs> 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 that's really my case. And you don't want to do Too it by yourself hours. because if you want to do before and after school care kids and you got to leave to go pick up kids and drop off kids, you don't want to work by yourself. You have to have someone working one of the mm -hmm. with you. Help you out. So I need sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I sleep. I know. <laughs> I've been supervising thirty years, mm -hmm. and I'm still sitting. I admire you. <laughs> yeah, of course. I'm still sitting. Plus, I did foster care kids. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. yes. Yep. It's a hustle. Mm -hmm. Life's a hustle. Life is a hustle. <laughs> you, can't, you can't worry about, I mean, everybody has to sleep, you have to sleep for your health. But you got to look at this as a moving situation we're in here. The world turns while you sleep. So hey, we're getting some good quotes out of here. We got so, not today, we got life's a hustle. <laughs> life's a hustle. I want to tell those. people that it's a hustle. You got to make that money, you got to pay that mortgage, you want to live decent. Mm -hmm. You got to hustle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The problem is that sometimes you get some help and that person that work with you want fifty percent of what you make. So uh -huh. I have my needs. And oh. I pay her pretty good. <laughs> okay. I pay her pretty good. So she's sure. been with me for well, a long that, time. Well, so. How old is she? My niece? My niece is thirty. 30. Oh she's in her uh -huh. Of course. Okay. <laughs> Love kids, you can't have kids looking at kids. <laughs> You've got to have responsible people looking at kids. Okay. But, yeah. you know, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it's the rule, the law states that you can't have more than five at any point in time. No, right? yes. So you can have an actual the, eight kids if they're on different mm -hmm. schedules. Exactly. And that's what I do. I rotate in between mm -hmm. when I have kids. Which, again, you know, if, if you are in a situation, you could also adopt a model of that, too. Uh, if you're in a situation where you're not making enough money or you need to 
um, you want to make more, mm -hmm. you know, you could go, that's another way as opposed to just increasing the prices, you can add more kids, but it also adds more to your day. Increasing well. the prices is not the greatest way to go these yeah. days, unless you're in a great neighborhood right. that have good paying, high working, paid clients, yep. you're not going to make it. They're well, going to owe you. And, and, and that's a good point. And that, you know, and there, that's where you need to know, as a business owner, you need to know what clients you have, too. Yep. There are some that, you know, are going to all be subsidized because of the area of income. location you're in, income levels you're in. There are some where it's more private pay, um, you know, available, and there's less subsidies or things like that. So you have to know what the flexibility is and be a smart business owner is to say, you know, what can I do in this situation? You know, or you can do a mix of subsidized and private pay. That's what I used to do in old way. I used to do the mix between the private pay and the subsidized customer. But now in North Brunswick, all the customers that I have are subsidized customers. And I don't turn them down. I mean, but that's, you know, getting back to what we were talking about, is that's where, um, where if we are anticipating, we can start to anticipate, you know, our level of cash and think about what we would do if we are in a shortfall position to kind of mitigate some of that risk and to kind of continue the business on. So um, really treating it like a, a, a real business. And you ladies, I know you came in late, uh, Lydia and, and Paula, where are you located? Location. Elizabeth, New Jersey. Elizabeth. Elizabeth. You're both in Elizabeth? Uh, but no, Belleville. Belleville. Belleville and Elizabeth. Me, Elizabeth. Okay, good, good. Okay. Um, so if we are in a situation where um, we need to add additional cash into the business, and we can only know that if we are kind of looking at our numbers and our finances, um, there's a couple ways we can do it. We can capital infusion, which is basically taking money out of our pocket and putting it into the business. Okay. One thing I would caution you about doing that is don't make that become the norm because then you get into a habit of funneling more money into your business. If you are in a situation, maybe you lost a kid or maybe a couple bills propped up or something like that, um, you know, you have to put money in, you might want to also make that and record that as something that's going to be paid back to you, okay? So paid back unless, you know, um, make it like a note, a formalized note. I'm putting in $5,000 and I'm going to take it out in six months or whatever like that. <coughs> So you're not getting in the habit of constantly pumping money into your business because I've seen a lot of business owners that do that. Oh, I'm short, you know, on payroll this month, or I'm short on paying these bills. Let me put some money in, and then it just becomes, you know, a cycle where you, it's hard to get out of. So if you do get into a situation where you have to put more money into it, um, you know, make sure you have a system where you can take that money back and make yourself whole again and make the business really. Um, provide for itself as opposed to you being the source of cash to it. Because then you're not really running a business, you're running a charity that you're just contributing to. Stay away from this guy, he looks a little, a little creepy there. Um, loans, okay, could get a loan, and I, uh, as Kelly mentioned, she was able to get a loan. But like we talked about before, if you are going for a loan, you have to be prepared. And you have to, you know, have your books and records in place. You have to, um, you know, have your tax returns available to you. So, uh, you folks, as you um, went through this process, and I know Meta, you worked with Meta on a lot of this stuff, and we asked for certain financial information. Okay, that's because the loan you're getting is federal funds, and federal funds it comes to us through the Small Business Administration have certain restrictions that we have to check. You know, you have uh, there are certain things that you know, if you are in default on um, federal funds or if you have certain other conditions, you cannot receive federal funds, okay? We're not, we weren't trying to bug you or to uh, put you in an awkward situation, but we have our own requirements too that we can only lend money under certain things. So you have to be aware of those things too. You should, you should find out if you ever do want to go for a loan, what the requirements are, what you have to need, and what you have to get in place. And the quicker you get that information together, the easier the process goes. Yes. What about grants? 
What about grants? Um, as a general rule, there are not a lot of grants available, okay? And I always like to tell uh, the business owners I work with, if, you're, if your business model is focused on you getting a grant, you don't have a very good business model because they're hard to get and they can be very competitive. Um, you know, there's not a lot of grants out there for individual business owners. There might be some, and what I would always say to people is, look to the closest source to you first. So the first thing, who's the most interested in you having your business operation? Well, I would say, you know, your provider agency is, is your first source. Talk to them, say, is there any money that comes to you that could be granted out? You know, and then maybe look at your town, your municipality, see if they have any type of grants available, and then the county or something like that. But it's a process and it's also very competitive. The little bit of grant money there is available or could be available, everybody wants. You know, so you, you again you still have to be prepared and ready to move on that money. But you know, keep it out there and talk to the people that are closest and more the most interested in your business being open and being ready to go. Um, factoring is not a big uh, thing for you. What factoring is, is that if you do have a high degree of receivables, you can actually sell those receivables to what's called a factor company, and they will pay you money so you'll have the cash quicker. Uh, an easy example to explain that is, I don't know if anybody has ever gone to H&R Block or one of the tax repairs, and um, they say, okay, we'll do, we'll do your taxes for you, you're going to get $3,000 back, and you know what, today we can give you that, we can give you $2,500, and we'll collect it when it comes back in in two months or whatever. They're, what they're kind of doing is factoring there. They're collecting your money, it's going to come a little later, but you're giving, they're giving you the cash up front at a, at a discounted rate. Um, so it's a good way, if you are desperate for cash, to kind of get some of that cash in quicker. Most of you seem like, which is very encouraging and refreshing, that you have a very good handle on collecting cash from your customers or the agencies that um, subsidize or everything like that. So that's um, that's a good thing. Trade payables could be another way to um, really help your cash position, and that's when you kind of buy things on credit, so you don't have to pay them right away. So, for instance, let's use an example. Okay. If, uh, if Maria, you know, has a, a, a customer and they've been good for a period of time and all of a sudden, you know, the parent calls up and says, look, we have a, a unique situation and, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not able to uh, pay you right away because uh, whatever, you know, something blew up in our house and we have to spend all our money on that. Can you still watch the kid? And Maria feels very bad for them, so she says, sure, and you can pay me later on. Well, now Maria might be in a cash situation, but what she could do is maybe work with some of the vendors she buys stuff from, and instead of paying cash for all those diapers and formula up front, maybe she puts it on her credit card, so now she's kind of extending out what she has to pay against when she's going to get paid, okay? So it's a balancing act, and that's what you need to you know, know, but that is another way that, she, it's not really a source of cash, but it's a way of managing your cash that, that you can look at. So, with that, does anybody have any questions, comments?